Hello, I'm Jim Rathmel, and I'm one of the authors of a recent practice guideline published in the March 2016 issue of Anesthesiology. This article is a group of practice guidelines for the prevention, detection, and management of respiratory depression associated with noraxial opioid administration. And this practice guideline was developed jointly by the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. Although I'm an author on the article, I don't speak on behalf of either organization. So a little bit of background first. We've known for many years that respiratory depression can and does occur after administration of noraxial opioids. The American Society of Anesthesiologists issued a practice parameter on this topic first in 2009. And this update reflects new scientific information and changes in expert opinion that have developed since that original practice parameter was published in 2009. Well, how have practice parameters developed? First, the American Society of Anesthesiologists collaborates with organizations who have members that have specific expertise, and they team those experts with two methodologists who are expert in systematic reviews. They agree on criteria for the evidence that they'll review, and then a systematic review of the literature is undertaken. Once that literature review is done, the experts join together and formulate the original opinions that are based on that evidence. After the original recommendations, the original guidelines are formulated, the panelists then present them in public forums and seek feedback from anesthesiologists and participants in those public forum. We also conduct member surveys of those organizations and incorporate the opinions of practicing anesthesiologists that respond to those surveys on very specific elements that are contained within the practice guidelines. And finally, that expert opinion, as well as the evidence, is synthesized into the final consensus recommendations and published as the practice guideline. So let's begin with the results of this particular update, where there is high-grade evidence available to support the recommendations in the practice guideline. And the first is a comparison of parenteral opioids with noraxial opioids. High-grade evidence suggests that parenteral opioids are just as likely, but no more likely to cause respiratory depression than noraxial opioids, as well as somnolence and sedation. And it's true with a single dose, an infusion, or patient-controlled analgesia. The risk is similar. The second area where there's high-grade evidence to support the recommendation is when comparing hydrophilic opioids like morphine with lipophilic opioids like fentanyl. They're just as likely, but no more likely to cause respiratory depression, somnolence, and sedation. There's also high-grade evidence that supports the notion that prophylactic naloxone and naltrexone do not prevent respiratory depression from subsequent administration of noraxial opioids. There are also a number of areas in the practice guideline that are supported only by expert opinion or the results of the survey when they're combined. And the first is recommendations about how best to identify patients at risk for respiratory depression. And the practice parameter says simply, performing a focused history and targeted physical examination, looking for those who might be at high risk for respiratory depression uh, is important. What about prevention of respiratory depression? Well, experts believe that patients with obstructive sleep apnea who are receiving positive pressure or ventilation should use those devices in the hospital. That may well reduce the risk, but there's not significant evidence to support that. The second expert recommendation is avoiding hydrophilic opioids in patients who are going home because of the more delayed onset of respiratory depression in a very small subset of patients who receive hydrophilic opioids. And the third is a pragmatic use the lowest efficacious opioid dose to minimize the risk of respiratory depression. And finally, if parenteral opioids or sedatives are given, we should increase the monitoring afterwards, perhaps keeping those patients in the hospital for a longer period of time, monitoring in a more intensive setting 
What about monitoring for respiratory depression? And these are very pragmatic recommendations. The first is monitoring patients for adequacy of ventilation, oxygenation, and the level of sedation. And to be specific, hydrophilic opioids like morphine appear to have some risk of delayed respiratory depression. So the recommendation is hourly monitoring for 12 hours and then every other hour for 12 hours. When lipophilic opioids like fentanyl are administered, continuous monitoring for 20 minutes and then hourly monitoring for two hours thereafter. And in high-risk individuals, like those with a history of obstructive sleep apnea, the monitoring, the level of monitoring should be increased. Further expert opinion regards treating respiratory depression. And these are very, very practical and straightforward. Well, when you're using noraxial opioids, you ought to have supplemental oxygen, IV access, and reversal agents available throughout the period you intend to monitor the patients. And treatment may, but doesn't necessarily involve the use of supplemental oxygen, administration of reversal agents, and or resuscitation with positive pressure ventilation. Pretty pragmatic and straightforward. The takeaway messages here are that life-threatening respiratory depression can and does occur with the use of noraxial opioids, just like when we administer opioids systemically. So patients should be monitored for respiratory depression, and that monitoring should be carried out early for the first couple of hours after lipophilic opioids and for the first 24 hours after the administration of hydrophilic opioids. When administering noraxial opioids, all patients should have access to supplemental oxygen, intravenous access in place, access to reversal drugs, and that access should be maintained throughout the entire period you intend to monitor patients based on the opioid they received. Thank you, and I hope this video abstract has been helpful.